So I spent most of yesterday with a guy called Rolf Konevsky, who is, without a doubt, the biggest horror fan I've ever met. When I was about three and a half years old, my father introduced me to Abbott and Costello movies. They did a series of monster movies, and probably one of the best in the genre ever is uh, Abbott and Meet Frankenstein. The beginning of that scared the hell out of me. Go into the phone. I could never get through the first werewolf transformation with Lon Chaney. Until finally, Costello says, you know, you'll have to get your dog away from the phone. I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> and then I got through the movie and thought it was great. So Rolf finds himself drawn to those horror movies that don't take themselves too seriously. I just fell in love with that blend of, of horror and humor, I guess. But at the same time, he's taking them incredibly seriously. Before long, he's seeking out absolutely everything he can get his hands on. I started watching all the horror films, renting out on video, going to horror conventions, reading Fangoria magazine. And like any horror fan, it doesn't take him long to start noticing certain patterns. You know, the cat scare. It's a cat jumping out of nowhere and scaring someone. And then... People splitting up and going into the basement by themselves. Go down the cellar and check the fuse box. You know, all these cliches. And so this gets him to thinking... I wonder how long it'll actually take to write a, a, a teenage exploitation horror film. So I wrote the script in five days, showed it to a few friends, they thought it was cute. Although his friends are one thing and his teachers are another matter entirely. Hampshire College, where I went, hates the horror genre. They were, you know, they love Hitchcock, but they hate horror, which was always weird to me. So I was like, okay, there's a very big difference between the academic world and the commercial world. We're talking late 80s at this point, so horror is... Huge on video, the market was booming, so it was a pretty safe investment. And I should say, at this point, Rolf is like... 19... 19 going on 20. So there's this 19-year-old kid going door to door asking for... Just over 100000 maybe $120,000. And somehow he manages it. He gets like 90% of the budget, when all he needs is that last little push. My parents um, decided to uh, mortgage the house. And uh, we, we shot the film in the summer of 1989. And the film is remarkable. It's about this group of friends who go up to a cabin in the woods, and amongst them is this guy called Mike, who's a massive horror fan. So behind the camera you've got Rolf, who's obviously... Watched, I'd studied, I... He knows the genre. I knew the genre. But on screen you've got Mike, who knows the genre just as well. Don't forget, I have rented out every single horror film on videotape, and what we just went through is called a warning stage. So there's this bit where Mike hears a sound in the woods, and you're expecting him to run in and check it out. I should investigate. But instead... Back chance. And then later on he even has his own cat scare moment. But he reacts like a horror fan would. Where did it come from? There's nothing up here but ceiling. So with a little help from Mike, all the characters start to figure out what we already know. So you're saying we're in a movie? It's a distinct possibility. Even the title is self-aware. It's called There's Nothing Out There. There's nothing out there. Which is one of those classic horror movie lines, you know, even when they can practically see the danger at the window. Sure, there's nothing out there. There's nothing out there. I don't give a shit. And so at 19, Rolf has effectively made the first postmodern horror movie which he takes to the... The Independent Feature Project in New York City. Where it just blows up. It was the hit of the, of the IFP. I mean, I have the, I have the articles to prove it. Audiences love it, critics love it, the um, film journal says that there was... Very little worthwhile in the festival, except for one entry that unspooled at the end. There's nothing There's out there. nothing out We got calls from California while the screening was going on saying we have to see the movie. There was a guy who was head of uh, acquisition at Universal who said, I heard about the film, we're looking for a director for Charles Play 3, I want to see it. But outside of that bubble, there's this storm cloud looming on the horizon. Between the time we started the movie and the time we finished post-production on the movie, the genre had collapsed. As in, overnight. It was thriving in the, in the end of the 80s, and then in 1990, Tremors came out and bombed. No Richter scale can measure it. They didn't know how to sell it. Nightbreed was sold as a slasher movie. No scientist can explain it. Nightbreed's really more of a fantasy thing. I was watching these movies, like, you know, just, just destroy themselves. And so suddenly, interest in There's Nothing Out There just dries up. And even the execs from before who've seen the film are saying, We love the film, but we don't know what to do with it. There's nobody in it. Where's Jim? It's too funny to be scary. It's too scary to be funny. Jim's in the other room melting right now. <laughs> and it was frustrating because I'd, I'd start seeing things like Leprechaun getting this 2000 screen release and the audience hating it. You got a light for an old Leprechaun's pipe? 
And I was like, I could just keep the audience here to watch my, you know. And from there, things just go from bad to worse. The film opens in New York on the same weekend as... Super Bowl Sunday and a blizzard. And then in Los Angeles, just before the... The good old L.A. riots came about. And so Rolf's big break is dead on arrival. Or so he thinks. I've been going around and I've been going to horror film festivals and fangories and things like that. This is a few years later, and as he's been doing more and more, Rolf gives a copy of the film to a young producer who... Watched and called me up and said, I thought it was great, let's have lunch. So we had a really nice lunch together. He said, it's a lot of fun, I thought you did a great job, I'm gonna, I'll show it to my father. And that producer is Jonathan Craven, son of Wes. A year or two passes and Rolf hears nothing back. And then I heard about a movie coming out called Scream. What's your favorite scary movie? Now, I don't know if you want to go, you want to go into this whole thing. So, Scream. Wes Craven's Scream comes out in 1996, makes $200 million, is almost immediately identified as the first self-aware horror movie. The teenagers weren't making the same old stupid mistakes. And Rolf's looking at it, and especially um, at Randy. Played by Jamie Kennedy. Who seems to have a hell of a lot in common with Mike from There's Nothing Out There. Not only in that they both know a lot about the horror genre, but in that they use that knowledge to survive. We've had warnings, murder attempts, and you're going out for a walk in the woods. They play the horror genre at its own game. Never, ever, ever say, I'll be right back. And that's not the half of it. What really got me, I guess, the most was that there were so many similarities, but the lines were just different enough. Name a horror film. Any horror film. That it almost seemed like someone was purposely changing them. Standard horror movie stuff. And so Rolf's looking at this film being hailed for its originality, and all he can think is... I think you have a copycat on your hands, G. <sighs> Between the, the, as I said, the blizzard and the Super Bowl Sunday and the riots in L.A., you know, the film never really got the shot it deserved, even though, you know, it got the reactions. And that's a lot for any filmmaker to take on board. So, um... Let alone one right at the beginning of their career. Yeah, it was a, it was a great, you know, training ground for Hollywood, because over the years, you know, you, you come about very similar stuff, you see the pattern, so I learned it all, you know, very quickly on my first go-around. 20 years later, Rolf is pretty diplomatic about the whole thing, especially now that the films are out there for people to make their own minds up about. In fact, recently he put the film on DVD. And I was scared that I said, okay, I, now the film's getting re-released, it'll get reviewed again, I just hope people don't think I ripped off screen. And then the LA Weekly, we got the video pick of the week, and it said this movie is a virtual blueprint for the West Craven franchise. So, you know, time will tell. Maybe in a few years we'll all be lining up outside, there's nothing out there, midnight screenings, and pestering Rolf to make a follow-up. I do have another script that's not There's Nothing Out There, but it's in the same universe. Great title for it. I thought, okay, what's the other line besides There's Nothing Out There that you've seen in every single horror film? They, they say every single time from the director of There's Nothing Out There, this isn't funny anymore. <laughs> Says it all. Anyone in the genre knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs>